the instant high that you get from when, you know, 10,000 people are laughing their heads off. Is, what's, your, what's your brain doing? What are your neurotransmitters doing? The human brain is, you know, an extraordinary three and a half pound gland that is like quantum, it's quantum neurology, it's quantum physiology, that the moment you think you understand it, it comes up with something else. Because I don't have an act, per se, but more kind of a cesspool of consciousness, just, you know, ideas. Moments when I'll be on a roll or something will happen that, that I'll fire off and you can't help, it's like being possessed, it's like channeling. When it works, it's great, and when it doesn't, it's painful. But when it's working, it's that, it's that weird thing about you surfing and kind of like you're in you know, that thing, athletes describe it as the same thing of being, oh, it's working. My name is Susan Schneider Williams. My husband, Robin Williams, two sentences, Leonard. It all happens in two sentences. We had unknowingly been battling a deadly disease, a disease for which there is no cure. Robin's, the devastation on Robin's brain from Louis bodies was one of the worst cases medical professionals have ever seen. Yet throughout all of this, his heart remained strong. Unchosen path. Robin started acting out of character. Nearly every region of his brain was under attack by Louis bodies. <sighs> Can you imagine the pain he felt as he experienced himself disintegrating and not from something he would ever know the name of or understand? I hate to have to report this. The breaking news just into CNN is that actor Robin Williams is dead at the age of 63. We have just received word from the West Coast, tragic, devastating word. Robin Williams has been confirmed dead. They believe that the Bay Area resident committed suicide. We do know that at 11.55 this morning, Marin County Communications received a 911 telephone call reporting that a male adult had been located unconscious and not breathing inside his residence in unincorporated Tiburon, California. I felt tremendous remorse and guilt that, gosh, I could have done more, I should have done more. I know something must have been terribly wrong for someone as brilliant as Robin to just, you know, jump ship like that. In the immediate aftermath of Robin's death, the confusion and information was constantly changing. Robin Williams' battle with addiction and mental illness was no secret. Before the coroner's report came out, there was a lot of media speculation People were assuming the worst. He's broke or he's depressed or he's just given up. The highs are highs and the lows are lows. And there's nothing sadder than when a comedian is by himself. They painted him as the sad clown. Those close to Williams believe he had bipolar disorder. They thought he just committed suicide for something related to unhappiness, drugs, or depression. And of course, None of that is true. On Robin Williams' mind before his death, money, while it may seem strange. People given... fill in the blanks. Um, so, you know, a lot of that was going on. That last evening I spent with him, he was, he was completely sober and not on drugs, but just most uh, troubled by what he was going through. I think it's important that the truth comes out because there were so many affirmative things that Robin stood for, and we want to believe in all of them. We want to believe in him. And there's a danger that his suicide 
could occasion people to think, oh, well, he, he wasn't what we thought he was. We didn't know him after all, um, but we did. I felt like I was somehow being loyal to him by not speaking about the struggles that we saw. I think we felt like that wasn't anyone's business. And so the story is one of Robin being at the mercy of something that you could not control. And even worse than not being able to control it, not even knowing about it. It was not till October, I was called in to sit down to go over the coroner's report. There were no surprises about what was in his toxicology. I knew my honey was clean and sober. They sat me down and said, he, you know, essentially, Robin died of diffuse Lewy body dementia. What is that? They started to talk about the neurodegeneration. He wasn't in his right mind. He described how this were these Lewy bodies that were in nearly every region of his brain. It makes sense why he was experiencing what he was experiencing. Cognitive moods, movement, they were all affected. Depression, a fear, anxiety, hallucinations, delusional thinking, major sleep disorders, insomnia, paranoia. I remember walking out of that facility down the steps outside and feeling, now I had the name of it. It was the beginning of understanding what had really gone on. I was talking to someone I'd met at UCSF, and she said, send me the last two years of the medical records. I'll get them to Dr. Miller, and I know he'll be happy to see you. Lewy body dementia is devastating illness. It's a killer. It is fast. It's progressive. I'm looking at how Robin's brain had been affected. I realized that this was about as devastating form of Lewy body dementia as I had ever seen. Almost no area was left unaffected. It really amazed me that Robin could walk or move at all. The disease is devastating, but even more so when you realize that Robin did not have a diagnosis. He did not know where these new symptoms were coming from. The disease becomes progressively irreversible, unstoppable, uh, and always fatal, always fatal. But cures were far away from those. It affects many people, and sadly, one of the outcomes is suicide. If we had had the accurate diagnosis of Lewy body dementia, that alone would have given him some peace. His soul thrived here. Well, he grew up here. His roots were here. I mean, he, he started in uh, Detroit, but he went to school here at Redwood. Robin could live anywhere he wanted and chose to live in a neighborhood. Living in Marin, which is kind of like, you know, north of San Francisco is like, it's the idea of, this is it. I don't need to live. I can't. I mean, I don't do well in LA if I was living in a gated community. He said, I want to live with people. I love people. He liked Marin. It's a wonderful, beautiful place to live. He would ride his bikes every day. You run into him walking his dog outside, and you're like, oh, he's a totally normal guy. You know, really, not that different. People walking dogs saying hello. He's just trying to be normal, but then on the flip side, like, he's lived a, a crazy life. You would never know he was a superstar. The Throckmorton Theater in Mill Valley started doing the Tuesday night comedy nights. It was just comedy, yet it exploded, and partly because Robin Williams lived down the street. So all of a sudden, you've got an open mic, more or less, on Tuesday that's drawing 250 people on Tuesday, every Tuesday. The audience would go crazy. And Robin would come up after I already had a show, and we would do another two hours of improv. And this would happen all the time. 
And he literally would just get up at the end of the night and he would just crush it with no content. Nothing got him off as much as being in front of a live audience and getting to just free float and let his brain take him where he's going and react with the audience if someone throws something in from there or just take what he's saying and do 300 riffs on that. His mind was just so fast. I looked out there, there was a little kid out there. I saw a three-year-old kid who could barely use a fork or a spoon. He's eating, he's eating blueberries with his hands, and all of a sudden someone handed him an iPhone. He was like... <laughs> when you're playing with Robin Williams, you're not known for how you neck and neck with him. You're not known for how you beat him. You're known for how you just barely keep up with him. Look up here, Rick. There's people on the hills. <laughs> Hi, everybody on the hills. Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> Jesus at Comedy Day? Jesus at Comedy Day. I'll be back. <laughs> There'd be improvs where I'm on stage with Robin, and we would uh, sync up. And to see that in his eyes, that twinkle, that means we made it. It's impossible to describe genius or comedy, really. You can analyze it. But uh, I went with him to two days at Atlanta recording sessions on the Disney lot and watching him go back and forth and do all of these characters. Well, there's popsicles there. A doorstop would be a fabulous career. <laughs> Not bad. Good night, Alice. Out of all of every pore in his being, and he was so happy and joyous. Hey, go get him, you little crazy guy. <laughs> no, I don't care what I am. I'm free. Offer void, we're behaved by law. <laughs> you go, let's do that again. I could do that better. And they go, what do you mean you can do it better? He goes, no, just let me just roll it again. I, I think I have an idea, you know. And they're going, you think you have an idea? Good Lord. Oh, my God. I think the man has to float. He has to be able to come in there and go against the magic. He's got his own magic, and he just hasn't found it in himself yet. Unnecessary use of reptile, 500-year penalty. Watching these technicians desperately laughing and crying, trying to keep up with him and not screw up the dials while they're witnessing true brilliance. Enough about you. Talk about hair. She's a honey, huh? <laughs> Come on, talk about her features. Her hair, her eyes, her shoes. Be darling. Be witching. Be beautiful. When you're in the room with Robin, it is full go. Uh, thank you. Not at all. Theodore Roosevelt, 26th president of these United States of America, at your service. He was a constant spark, comedic spark, idea spark throwing in lines, improvising a ton. Some of the biggest laughs are things that Robin invented on the fly. I remember many, many days where Ben Stiller and I would look at each other because we're just watching Robin Williams off the top of his head just go off. And that kind of manic, wildly creative, bottomless pit of ideas, um, that mojo, that ability, which was like a superpower, I'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> the thing to know about the brain is that it's not static. The connections are always changing. We call it neuroplasticity. So you have someone who has a stroke, a part of the brain is damaged, it's not coming back. Some of those patients get completely better because the brain rewires. It has this resilience. And the determinants of resilience we don't quite understand but high intellectual abilities to begin with seem to go along with that kind of resilience. People who have great brains, who are incredibly brilliant, and can tolerate degenerative diseases better than someone who is average. The concept of reserve. Robin Williams was a genius. Robin was brilliant. He just knew things. But besides that, his, his extrasensory perception of life and of people and of me, he was a master at that. You could track it back to two years before he left. We'd go to the Throckmorton all the time. He always had an open invitation to go on. And what started to happen at around two years is he started to feel um, like he didn't want to go on. He just it wasn't as eager to uh, meet with people backstage or hang out too long in the green room. It was getting a little bit briefer, and he didn't, um, he just, there were more insecurities cropping up for him about going on stage. There were a couple of shows where I was expecting Robin to be there, and he didn't make it. 
for one reason or another. So that, that confidence that he had and the ability to go on and play, he just wasn't willing to go there as much anymore. It was starting to lessen. That was concerning. Something's off. Someone is seemingly performing just as they had, you know, for years and years, and then all of a sudden there's some very strange thing that happens, uh, and that raises concern. But then the next day they're okay again, and then over time those dips become deeper and deeper, and we have these fluctuations, especially in the beginning. The last thing they probably think of is that it's a degenerative brain disease. After that, things were just, life was busy, you know. He was working so hard on the crazy ones at that time, and it was getting more and more difficult for him to remember his lines, and he was getting more and more insecure about his performance. Mark. I know that he was sometimes having trouble with his lines and stuff up front, but he was really always able to power through and be that guy. And once you hit editorial, you'd find the Robin Williams that you know and love was always there. I propose we redo that 1972 spot and take a chance of making people feel. For my projects, we, we really stick to the script. But when you have Robin Williams, it would be folly not to let him do whatever he wants to do. Boss, <laughs> secret sauce. <laughs> drive through loving, oh. drive, drive through loving. Booty shake, booty shake, booty ah, shake, booty ah, shake. You didn't give me enough. Ketchup packets. <laughs> oh my God. So every take would be different. Uh, Ad libs and these comic nuggets would uh, come from Mars or somewhere, Robin's head, but a lot of them were gold. So I think that he, was, he may be a little slower out of the gate, but he finished strong. He'd managed to kind of power through it. He'd get up and he'd become this guy that you knew, remembered, and loved. Can you be serious? Well, maybe for a second. Yeah. No, see, <laughs> sorry. It's not easy to do a network television show. On top of that, he had Night at a Museum, and, you know, he's, he's doing double duty. The third movie, the last movie, I would say a month into the shoot, it was clear to me, it was clear to all of us on that set that something was going on with Robin. That's an experience that I've not spoken about. Um, publicly ever. We saw that Robin was struggling in a way that he hadn't before, to remember lines and to combine the right words with the performance. You know, when Robin would call me at 10 at night, at two in the morning, at four in the morning, saying, is it usable? Is any of this usable? Do I suck? What's going on? I would reassure him. And so I said, you are still you. I know it, the world knows it. You just need to remember that. My faith in him never left, but I saw his morale crumbling. I saw a guy who wasn't himself and he thought that was unforgivable. Louis body dementia is particularly tragic in the way that it increases anxiety, increases self-doubt causes delusions, misbeliefs that have never been present in someone. And imagine how hard that is for someone who doesn't even realize that uh, suffering from a degenerative disease, something that is slowly taking away the function of neurons across the brain. I think the thing that made Robin most special about this spectrum of abilities he had was the solid guy in the middle. That's who you are in the middle of all that other stuff. These things come and go. Who are you? Do you stay you? You know, what will you become? We met on the day he arrived in New York City. I remember really was different. I could see the beginnings. Robin and Christopher Reeve came into my third year class at Juilliard as advanced students. Christopher was my roommate, and Robin became very quickly my very best friend that I ever had. Yeah, we're hippies from space, and he's an Ivy League preppy. <laughs> I'm telling you, the three of us had some good times. He wasn't a comedian back then. He was a very serious actor. 
I went to New York and went to Juilliard, which was, you know, classical training. Right. Very much to be a thespian. For me, it was a wonderful thing. Number one, to be in New York. Right. Training, and also to get that type of training where you get the combination classical and the hardcore. And he was so believable visually, but, but as the way he used his voice, man, he was amazing. And it blew the faculty's mind as well as the students. But he was always funny. We'd be rehearsing lines. He would go off on my leash. Thou cock come, thou knowest not. And he would make up lines in iambic pentameter. But of course, you know, R-rated lines, X-rated lines. It was hilarious. It was hard for him because there was a lot of politics going on at Juilliard in that time. He left at the two thirds of the way through that year. I would go back to San Francisco and try yeah. and find acting work. And then took up stand up comedy as a, because right. I couldn't find acting work. The Holy City Zoo was the clubhouse for all the comedians. If you could get on a set when a Robin was promising to be there that night, you were gold. They packed the place. Ladies and gentlemen, Robin Williams. He drained every scintilla of laughter out of that crowd. But when he did that crazy stuff he did on stage, I think it let everybody else said, well, heck, you know? Told everybody else, yes, crazy stuff is acceptable. Robin is doing this in the 70s. I mean, 10, 15, 20 years in some cases before some of this is happening elsewhere. He came down to Hollywood and got up on stage at the comedy store in the improv, and it was like a landmine hit them, yeah. Is anyone here tonight on drugs? Yeah. OK. A quick test right now. If you are, it's OK. Let me have just a sip here, dear brother. The Reverend likes this stuff here. He was performing at the comedy store, and he was hilarious. And I just watched him, and I walked backstage, and he was sitting on the steps behind the stage. I saw him sitting alone. It seems so extraordinary to watch a guy completely demolish an audience and then seem so distant from what he had just done. No celebration, just like exhausted from pouring out so much energy. I got a phone call. It was Robin. He was up in Vancouver and he was working on Night at the Museum 3. And he was, he was having a panic attack. And he could not calm himself down. He's having such a struggle remembering just one line. Your life depended on me. So it's say that, say that. It wasn't enough that you took his head He off. got very frustrated. I remember him saying to me, I'm not me anymore. I don't know what's going on. I'm not me anymore. His mind was not firing at the same speed. That spark was diminished. Uh, the joy was sometimes not there. I had to work harder editorially to create it on screen because it wasn't always there in the same way on set. And I didn't resent that. It was more taxing. It took a lot more time and energy. But if that's what my guy needed, then that's what I was going to give my guy. The one thing that did bother me was the arm I'd frequently see him clutching his hand close to his, his chest a little bit, or he'd put it in his pocket and kind of mask certain things. We knew that he was fragile. And the deal was, sometimes we let, had to let Robin be alone, take a minute, catch his breath, particularly at the end of shooting. Uh, the last time I was with him, I, w I was on set. We were doing uh, shooting a uh, scene in a church. It was called Glory of Love. Let us saw the box move. Oh. And we had a room for him where he could uh, go between takes. And I went into that room. We talked a little bit about the scene. And um, he asked a few times, um, how's it going? Is it working? Um, but the subtext of it was, how am I doing? Am I working? His sense of security and confidence and, and who he was and what he was. There was something eroding within him. We didn't know what. You ain't got to give a little. 
because we knew he was getting tested. He was feeling um, infirm or not himself, and he was getting tested. And I think that those tests included uh, brain scans, and nothing was showing up. It wasn't like he's my son, and I can say, all right, time out. I'm going to pull you out of this because you're getting sick, and you need some rest. And I don't care what the teachers say. No, no, no. He's signed up. These are contracts you don't break. This is this, this, and the other thing. There's, what can I do? And Robin, he aimed to please. Every day, every minute, he aimed to please. If the studio or the network came begging for more interviews and more publicity, he would, he would always give it his all. His intellect and his mental acumen were, were so beyond ours that, um, it could be compromised a great deal, probably, and he would still be playing uh, a step ahead of the rest of us. How much of the script in the show is you... 23.5% uh, improv. Good. That's exactly <laughs> what I wanted. She hasn't finished the question yet, Robin. But I knew where she was going. Oh, okay. Is you dancing? <laughs> <laughs> There's one dance number, and it's the ballet. So Lewy body dementia, like all degenerative diseases, is a problem of plumbing and circuitry these degenerative diseases are caused by misfolding of proteins within neurons or the parts of the brain that allow us to move, think, and feel. We have 70 billion neurons. They slowly disintegrate. This bad protein, alpha-synuclein, relentlessly picks off neurons in a specific neighborhood, spreading through that neighborhood and then moves into different neighborhoods in the brain. And then finally, it's swept across the entire brain stem. Almost every neuron in that circuit with sleep, mood, anxiety, cognition has been affected. And that is really the late stage of dementia with Lewy bodies, the stage that no one can get out of. Soldiers have very refined bullshit detectors. And to see that instantaneous connection that Robin was able to make. What he understood about the American soldier was where they came from. Some of these kids are dying, they're getting wounded. He had a way of connecting with them that just made them feel so good. He was there for them, and they understood that. Yeah, there's combat, hardcore stuff, and then it's a lot of waiting around, and it's that stuff where people need things just to fight the boredom, and that is most important. And I think most people just kind of shocked that someone showed up, like, why are you here, man? Afghanistan, six times Iraq, five. Yeah, it's crazy. It's and you haven't fixed wild. it yet. That's disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know from going there, that's the best audiences in the world. I do have a story. I have... I've got a ton of them. A young man who was very seriously injured, and his girlfriend had decided it was just uh, a little bit too much for her to handle. And she, she had just left, and she was not coming back. She was on her way to the airport. So we, we walked in, and you could tell that he was in, um, in despair, and how afraid that he was in going forward that he would never have another girlfriend you know, about what his life was going to be like. And um, Robin pulled up the, his chair right be, beside his bed and started talking about fear. He went into some very personal things. I think we probably stayed an hour and a half. And, you know, we walked out and um, Robin actually said, boy, that was a tough one. He said, because for all of us, confronting our fears is a very difficult thing to do. And he said, I'm sure nobody ever thinks I'm afraid of anything. That was a big topic of conversation. Was their spouse going to stay with them? Were people gonna be looking at them differently? He actually talked about those kinds of things. He was willing to sit and talk about some of his own fears. 
we would visit hundreds, and um, I, I'll never forget one day, and he said, oh, Elaine, that was a tough one, and he said, he doesn't know that, but I have been so close to what he was talking about myself. It was early May and he came home and it was like a plane coming in with no landing gear. His resources were just spent. We were supposed to go to some friends and um, Robin couldn't, he couldn't get out of bed. It was becoming more of a normal that Robin's not feeling well. And I can't tell you why. We're just gonna stay home. His delusional looping would just kick in at night. We'd gone to a birthday party, um, our dear, dear friend Mort Saul. That night, Robin was up and he started talking about he was so afraid that Mort was not gonna make it through the night. And I, so we started to have this discussion again. It's like 12, 1 o'clock at night, and it goes to like 3.30 in the morning. And I mean, it goes. We're covering all the bases because he's convinced that he should go to Mort's house right now and make sure he's okay. That night, he was texting Mort, like, are you okay, are you okay? And Mort's asleep, most likely, you know? And so because he wasn't getting a response from Mort at 2 o'clock in the morning, he wanted to go there. So this was a typical night for us. There is something wrong. There is something not right here. And he said, I just want to reboot my brain. I just want to reboot my brain. We started to see some physical things happening to him, and he was trying to hide it with his arm and things like that, so we started to see it. One point he came up, and he was in a T-shirt. His ribs were actually showing. I grabbed his skin. Robin, you're really getting thin. He said, yeah, boss, I, I've gone to the doctor, but I don't know what it is. When he came to a party and we were all there, the comedians were they were flummoxed. They were overwhelmed. And uh, he was off lurking in the corners alone. I mean, can you imagine? You're at a party, and you, like, where's Robin? You look, and he's over in the corner fiddling around with a, you know, a bush or something. You're like, well, this is not good. He was suffering, and you could tell it. I tried to get him to go to a James Taylor concert with us, and. He says, I don't think I can. I go, well, I mean, I know you're tired, but I'll drive, and I'll come get you, and we have the tickets, and it's on me. And he goes, no, I don't think I can leave the house. And that kind of scared me a little bit, you know, because he was serious. And I go, well, OK. And I didn't really press him on it, but I mean, he was leveling with me that I don't think I can leave my house right now. And, I'm, and, and his speech patterns changed a little bit, but I don't. it's hard for me to talk about it. I, I knew there was something going on. I spoke with Robin almost every day or text and stuff. Eyewitnesses processing reality completely different than the way everybody else. And it just, the only reason I talk about that is, is his brain was giving him misinformation, complete misinformation. Going from where Robin and I had our world together, that was our sanctuary. It's so lovely to see that you're so happy and everything. How did the two of you meet? Seriously? Outside an Apple store. It was a busy Saturday. I had to go to the Apple store. And I start heading to the back, and I see this man dressed in camo. He was just smiling at me. And I thought, I think that's Robin Williams. And I thought, all right, I'm just going to go say hi. I have camo pants on. She said, how's that camo working for you? I went, really good. Obviously, you saw it. We just started talking, and we had the connection of 12-step stuff. You know, we both had crazy drug and alcohol days earlier in our lives. 
he knew enough information to be able to find me if he wanted to, you know, at one of the regular 12-step meetings. It's the next Tuesday night, I was at my regular thing. I looked around the room, I didn't see him. I thought, oh well. Midway through the meeting, I turned around and and uh, there, he, <laughs> there he was in the back of the room. Then I turned around real quick and thought, oh my God, he's here. But it was kind of sweet. And then I was like off and running. It was kind of wonderful. He told me he met this girl that she knocked him out. He told me he was in love. You know, men don't usually say that to each other. You are most beautiful. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm just sending you a gigantic love, and I hope you're wonderful. So I'm not right now, your hands are covered in paint. Oh, lucky hands. Paint on. Paint on, my little Picasso. Paint, 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 paint. Ah, uh, no, no, no. Sign it off. Bye. My partner in crime, who we've been walking sober, clean and sober together, and enjoying all the rawness and authenticity of life together. Like, you know, this is Susan and Robin, and it was great. You know, it was like, a, mm, I'm going to raise up. Let me lift myself up to love. We just had a, a theme, a way of, of approaching life that was so in sync. We just were like two little kids. We were looking at the world together, you know, almost like through each other's eyes. That was like having a best friend, you know, where you could really explore life together. Yeah, we did for about four years. We'd had promise rings that we'd worn for the, a year already. Doesn't everybody do promise rings? <laughs> I don't know. We, we knew we wanted to get married. October 22nd, 2011. It was storybook. Wow, I'm just picturing him. Um, he sure looked good. <laughs> Part of my wedding vows was, was really all about loving him as he is. I have no desire to change this man. And you had your honeymoon in Paris. Paris. Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. The great thing is in Paris, the, all the paparazzi are like wildlife photographers. All of a sudden you look over there like, Robin, kiss her. <laughs> Lift up her skirt. No, get away from me. Kiss her, kiss her, do it now. <laughs> the comedian will now attempt to kiss the tall woman. Right? <laughs> He had come home from a uh, night at the museum. He was basically home for a week. He was exha absolutely exhausted. We were looking at like a week of testing. The calendar was just booked. So we had this day at the beginning of it all. I said, you know, why don't we go out to um, Tennessee Valley, go on a walk out there, which we loved. We just loved our walks. This is when I realized my honey had never, ever been on a picnic. It was a pretty windy day. But as we got out there, there weren't a lot of people, and um, it was so nice to have space around us in nature. We went over to the rocks and um, ate our sandwiches, and it was just us, and it was peaceful. It was one of those moments in the midst of this frenzy of trying to find out what's going on, like the drum beat was getting more and more. And he was depleted. He was so so depleted and uh, he just put his head down in my lap you know and I just I just stroked his hair and he just laid in my lap for like a couple hours my guy was tired so the first time that Robin came into my shop it was in 1983 and it was shortly after John Belushi died. When John Belushi passed away, it devastated Robin. John was crazier than anybody. And but man, did he pay the price. And, and you know, it hit him like a sheet of cold ice. He pulled out of a dive. He stopped everything but white wine for one year. And he didn't go to AA. And I mean, wow, you know, how are you doing this? He goes, just uh, because I have to, you know? He didn't want to die. And of course, he'd always been 
really physical. You know, he was an athlete. He was a good athlete. He took up cycling, and he started riding more and more, and we started seeing him more and more. You are a, um, a keen cyclist. Yes, sir. I am a bike sexual. Yes, sir. I like to ride the bike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, for me, it's my meditation. It's what I do. I can uh, get on my bike and ride about, you know, sometimes 20 miles, sometimes 40 or 50 miles, and it's great. It's beautiful. He said that, you know, cycling was the closest thing to flying. And it allowed him to free himself from all the things that went on in, in his mind, because his mind was so active, right? Robin and running and biking was always in struggle. You know, you have to push yourself, you have to challenge yourself. And Robin, as an artist, challenged himself to do roles that were like stretching himself. He wanted to prove that he wasn't just a comedic actor, he was an actor. When you're improvising, you're going out, you're looking. As I've been going, talking to flowers, and how you doing, please cough. You know, when you're playing like that, you're going out. But by stopping that, it forces the energy to implode and you find you explore yourself. Either memories or, you know, different emotions. Well, Captain, my Captain. Sit down, Mr. Andrews. Dead Poet Society almost didn't happen because they really just wanted him to do it. The writer asked me, how could we get Robin to reconsider this and maybe do this? I said, well, you need to involve him in the creative process and at least give him a voice in choosing the director. I said, make him a short list, but Peter Weir was at the top of it. And he said, I'm in, if you can get Peter Weir. And it happened. Thank you, boys. And he gave me a sweet gift. And um, me <laughs> when, when he's looking at the yearbook from when he was a student. Gentlemen. <laughs> we were just looking in your old annual. <laughs> then the kids no, it's not. show him this yearbook. He gets down on his knees and goes, No, it's not me. <laughs> Stanley the Tool Wilson. Stanley the Tool Wilson. Which was his nickname for me. <laughs> God. What was the Dead Poets Society? So I'm sitting with him at the premiere next to the heads of Disney, and I just, and he was smiling, and he wouldn't look at me, but I started crying when this came on, and that was his thank you to me for helping. And he was brilliant. Invincible, just like you feel. The world is their oyster. He always wanted to push himself. He did. And I think that's incredibly admirable, you know, because you don't have to do that. When you're wealthy and famous and people the world over love you and want you to make them laugh, We liked to go play basketball with a local group that helps developmentally disabled adults. His neurologist, who also attends that, had um, not seen him since December when the suspicion about his, uh, the shaking of his hand was, you know, it was, keep an eye on it, but at that point it was so minimal, maybe it's because of this previous shoulder injury. Well, basically that night, um, that doctor made a visual diagnosis from way across court. All he knew was that we were gonna be going in to see the GP. When he was told he had Parkinson's. And they're saying it's early to mild and you, you know, that's great, so okay, we get on medications, we'll figure this out, you, you'll you know, get it adjusted. They were saying 10 good years. I could see he wasn't buying it. Robin got to ask these questions, um, which at the time seemed like, you know, the, he asked, am I, um, do I have Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's? Do I have dementia? Am I schizophrenic? And the answers were no, no, and no. The real depth of these symptoms, he only knew. The rest of us were working with what we could. In Robin's case, there was a focus on his movement, but I think internally for Robin, this was only a tiny part of the symptoms that he was experiencing. Another very early feature of dementia with Lewy bodies is visual hallucinations. They often believe that these hallucinations are real. 
So for Robin, learning that he had Parkinson's disease was not enough. Is an old friend of mine and a former classmate at Juilliard School in New York, Robin Williams. Look at the or somebody's fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Robin and Christopher were very good friends. You know, Christopher is a preppy from New England because that was our slightly younger brother. And the three of us were, you know, Brother Williams, Brother Wilson, and Brother Reeve. Christopher, we went to see him when he first had this accident. He just had the accident, and <laughs> there were people making decisions whether or not to keep him, you know, on life support. Robin went in disguised as a doctor into the emergency room. <laughs> I said I was a Russian proctologist. <laughs> and most of the other doctors, oh, no. And he looked up and he kind of went, hey, brother, what's up? And I said, would you mind? I'm just going to do a brief exam. Like what you said, uh, if you feel two fingers, it's your luck. <laughs> you know, and, and he laughed and he said, hey, brother, what's happening? And it was that idea of, you know, even in the face of that. That's right. And it helped. I mean, he, you know, he's an extraordinary guy. First one to show up down in Virginia when I was really in trouble. He came here to Kessler one afternoon and just... I got to wear a seatbelt in his chair because I would have fallen out laughing. When Christopher, we went to see him when he first had this accident, we both talked and said, I never knew he was this strong. And he and Robin didn't either. And he says, I, I don't think I could go through that. And I wouldn't want to, you know. He looked very frail when he came back from the museum picture. He used to come over like every afternoon. He'd sit in a chair I had in a corner. He'd mumble along about it, but he never described the severity to me of losing everything. I'd trick him even when he got depressed. I'd say, well, a lot of times I want to jump off the roof. Really, he'd say. But uh, I said, yeah. Uh, I said, but you can't jump off the roof because you can't leave Susan alone. And as soon as I got anywhere near saying her name, he'd go, ooh, ooh. Admiration all the time. That's the thing he kept getting over to me all the time. He'd say, you know, now I finally got it right. So he saw a tremendous irony in getting sick. He had these introspective moments and a lot of depression as it approached. But he didn't verbalize that to me, and uh, he just wasn't laughing a lot. People believe that there is psychology and then there is neuroscience, and they're not the same. But in fact, it's all related to how our brain circuits are working. This is very hard for our society to understand and grapple with because we have a different way of thinking about psychiatric disease. There's a, not a realization that the chemical changes in the brain are responsible for the psychiatric symptoms. Let me buy a disease it is brain circuits that cause troubles that people assume are, you know, behavioral, not potentially related to a disease. Someone has Parkinson's disease and they have shaking and they can't walk, then, oh, that's clearly a, a disease. But in fact, it's pure semantics. There's no difference. It's just different circuits are being affected. It flows over someone like a massive wave, no matter how moral, ethical, good, brilliant someone is when they get you know disease of the magnitude of dementia with Lewy bodies they get very sick and they change enormously in a psychiatric way it affects sleep very early this is another very hard part of Lewy body disease when they're asleep they suddenly act out their dreams we call REM behavior they can strike out during a dream and actually hit people at night the lack of sleep had been building very intensely since December. 
He's thrashing at night now, which is a Parkinsonian-type symptom. So now, what was happening, you know when you first fall asleep, like you start to go deep pretty quick if you're tired? He would go, honey, what did you think about, you know, like, like in a daytime voice, was loud. No one was getting sleep. It was just, it was impossible because the delusional looping. And then the degree to which the paranoia came in it was so drastic. He's just going from room to room, literally watching me. He's making a lot of phone calls and texting people and questioning, I'm sure I know it was a lot about questioning my loyalty to him. And, um, and then I'm like back in the studio and, and he's watching me and he's standing there in a frozen stance and he wasn't moving. And then he'd come out of it, and he was so upset with himself. He, there were other scenes going on for him. There were other ideas about us. What part of this is, is free will? He had this awareness of what he was doing, and that pained him, because he knew it wasn't us, it wasn't right. There's that core of that person that is still completely maintained. And they struggle with this. And, you know, they struggle with how they're changing. And they, you know, often don't uh, have a good logical conclusion about it. So it, it's very hard. Robin is um, not getting enough sleep. The therapists are like, not getting sleep can be really dangerous. When we were told to um, to sleep apart because he needed to get sleep, he came to me and he said, does this mean we're separated? For someone so brilliant to say something like that, such a mismatch of reality. Five minutes later, he was back and he realized no, we're in love and we're married. There's no, I'm not leaving him. Robin was in the house visiting and he wanted to look out the back window, look at our boat dock and our boats and get a different view. And so he looked out the back window here of our sunroom. He stood there and stood there and stood there for about 10, 12 minutes motionless. Didn't say a word, just stood there and looked for the longest period of time, way too long. I finally said, uh, Robin, let's go back outside. In the middle of the storm, we kept trying to stay in the center. By now, though, we were seeing the therapists every day. It's bike rides, it's 12-step work. Meditating together helped a little bit. We went to a, a hypnotist out at Stanford. And God bless him, man, he did everything. I would come in the room and he'd be sitting there doing this thing. And it was part of the deal to like hypnotize yourself. Kind of worked a little bit, but it would always be like, temporary. But he would, he would keep trying. He was a freaking warrior. The way that he was able to battle the inner turmoils, the inner fears, he was blessed with what his heart was capable of in the midst of fear. Go your whole life never knowing how you look, and then there you are. You get hungry, you get stupid, you get shot and die. Then you get this quick glimpse of how you look to others to the world around you. It's never what you thought. Oh, he could do what nobody else could do. He could do what very few artists have ever been able to do. He was just, he was beautiful. I remember the day I found out, I was, I was thrilled. Robin Williams is gonna come do Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo. You know, he's, he's the tiger. The fact is, tigers are atheists. All of us, unabashed. Heaven and hell, these are just metaphorical constructs which represent hungry and not hungry. 
I would see him waiting after the play, after we come out from a two hour and 20 minute show, and he's waiting for every single person to get their picture and to sign their playbill. And I learned patience and I learned compassion. He's everything you want from, from a, a fellow artist. Looking hot in the green room in Mill Valley. Yes, he's <laughs> Let me go in and extend these mercy calls to the comedians in the green room. They all looked upon him as a hero, and he's more than generous. Wait, can we get you doing the guy who hit our car today, please? Oh, no, dude. No, dude, no. It's nothing. Dude, it's you just you hit my rental car, man. No, dude. I did, but nothing happened. It's almost like we've been here before, but nothing happened. Do you have insurance, maybe? Oh, not at all, thank you. <laughs>last bike ride with Robin, I asked him at the beginning of the ride, you look beat, are you sure you're okay for a ride? You look exhausted. He said no, he needed it. He really needed it and was ready to do it. But it was clear he was off. Off in a way he had not ever been off before. Much slimmer, just sort of not there. A couple times he was over in the lane, uh, way more than he should have been, way more toward the center of the lane. He asked a lot of weird questions. Seemed oddly distracted, turn around, and he'd say stuff like, um, what time you got, boss? Never asked me that on a ride ever before. I'd say, I don't know, we left at 1, we're halfway through, 1.30? Thanks, boss. 30 seconds later, what time you got, boss? 45 seconds later, the same question again. There were several other questions he asked that were sort of odd and didn't make sense. Um, you know, something along the lines, I think we should maybe get, get, be getting back. And we took one loop, we're getting back, you know, that kind of stuff. Before you notice it, he started to leave me. He just was, you know, 20 yards and then 40 and then 100. This had never happened in the ride. And all of a sudden he was 100 and some yards and I couldn't catch him. I busted butt to catch up. I, I couldn't do it. I mean, he pedaled all the way to the house and we got to the house and he said, hope you don't mind boss, but I gotta get in uh, today. I got stuff to do and I said, fine. And he hustled in the house. Uncharacteristically, around 9.30 in the evening, Carol noticed Robin and Leonard standing out front. I went outside and I asked if everything was okay. And he said, yes, uh, I, I'm okay. Just sort of a pat answer. And then he said, boss, I really need a hug. And so I gave him a hug, and he started to cry at that point, put his head down. So I put my arm around his shoulder, but then I asked him, Robin, Robin, are you okay? Is anything wrong that we, that I could help? Uh, are you in pain? He said, uh, no boss. Uh, he talked about family and what was going on in his life and some things that I think he felt I would keep private. It took about 15 minutes, he said, bye boss. I said, I'll see you tomorrow. And he walked home. We were gonna try, you know, get to bed at a decent hour and we stayed up for a little while, which is what we did that week. When, you know, sleeping apart, it's like, well, we'd stay in our bed together until it was time to go to sleep. Again, I'd read to him that it was just time, it was time for sleep. And he, um, he went into his office, which is right by our room, and he, he went back there a couple times to get things. And I saw he had his iPad, and I thought, this is really good because he hasn't wanted to read or do any, you know, anything in a long time. We just said goodnight to each other, you know? Good night, my love. Good night, my love.
we'd been meditating every morning together. So when I got up and he wasn't up yet, I thought, oh my God, the door's still closed. He's sleeping. He's sleeping. This is really good. His assistant showed up because I had some work stuff to go over and you know, I, I had to take off and I just told her, I said, just, you know, text me when he's awake. Apparently he had slept in and they couldn't figure out why he was sleeping in because it kind of wasn't him, right? And they tried to go in the room and it was locked. And then I got a text saying, he's not up, what should I do? I knew, I just knew there was something terribly, terribly wrong that wasn't right. And I just texted, wake him up immediately and, and call me. She called me back. Susan had just come back. Dan and Rebecca were outside the house. The police were showing up, and they didn't know what was going on. Sister came in the kitchen and said, how are you? And I said, I'm fine. She goes, oh, so, you, oh my god, you don't know. And then she told me, you know. I was, I was just hit by the, you know, with a tsunami of grief. I'm driving back on this day three years ago, and a reporter from a tabloid called me on my phone. I don't even know how they got my number. And said, do you have any comments about the death of your friend Robin Williams by suicide? And I threw my goddamn phone across the car and kept driving. I remember very distinctly, we were standing out front, and you could hear a helicopter coming. He said, OK, here they come. The whole Bay Area felt like a sledgehammer had hit it in the head that day, and, and New York, too, and Hollywood, and everywhere. It was like a war zone. Helicopters circling, news vans pulling up, their big satellite dishes, and they're all setting up cameras. They're knocking on our door, asking for comment. It got pretty crazy around here. Like the global media descended on this little cul-de-sac. How everybody just wanted their peace. We felt that it was a huge invasion of privacy. Uh, this was a horrifically tragic event to happen to normal people that are our neighbors. We also had fans of Robbins that just wanted to come and, and pay tribute. And they would stand peacefully in front of his house and, and lay flowers down and just pay their respects. You know, it's like really having a limb or something ripped from you and you can't heal it right away. I just, I remember walking out of that facility down the steps outside and feeling the last year and a half of really hard work that my husband and I went through. I had the beginning of an answer. I started digging in for about the next year. come back from Louis body dementia. There is no cure. You know, depression you can come back from. He had come back from that earlier in life. Clumsy as it was, not in the right state of mind due to the tricks that the disease plays on you and uh, the lack of sleep and the everything. But I think he just probably somewhere in his brain decided 
I don't want to bring everybody down with me. I don't want to spend a year or two going down this path. Maybe he didn't have quite that level of consciousness, but knowing Robin, I want to ride my bike. I want to be with my beautiful wife. I want to do comedy. These things will probably all be off the books, you know, in, in, in a very short time. I just know that he finally one day said, I'm not going to go where this is taking me. But he's just so joyous, and um, this, there would have been no joy in his life. No, he wasn't ready to go. He wasn't ready to go at all. And he stuck around longer than he felt like it. I mean, I just know him because he wasn't ready to say goodbye to Susan or to life. You know, when someone gets sick like that, because it's so confusing, it's not their heart that's sick. You know, it's the mainframe. It's the computer. And that's very different, very different. Bluey body gives nobody a chance to prepare. The psychiatry is the disease. It's a manifestation of the disease in the brainstem. I think in this country, this is a big problem that mental health and neurology are seen as separate. In fact, it's all abnormalities of brain circuits when when your brain is not functioning to allow you to be a fulfilled human being. There's a tendency to blame people for their behaviors and their illness, and a certain mindset uh, around disease that people are responsible for their own disease. They aren't. I think this is a blame-free world, just like when someone has cancer. No blame. Robin Williams' widow is speaking out about the beloved comedian's trust. Speaking out for the first time since he took his life. Susan Williams is breaking her silence. It's been a year since his death. I, I see you're still wearing your wedding ring. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. It's been a year of grieving, um, and it's been a year of really trying to get to the bottom of what killed my husband. Susan Snyder Williams wrote an editorial for the journal Neurology for her first TV interview since writing about Robin's health struggles. People think your husband killed himself because he was depressed. Everyone thought that he died from suicide, from depression, but that wasn't the case. No, he, Robin did not die from depression. Robin had a deadly disease, and it's called Lewy body dementia. Everybody deals with grief in their own way. The part that needs the focus and attention is let's let's cure these this disease. No one should have to go through that. No one should have to feel the level of pain that Robin felt. And he, you know, he's one of millions. But what she's done is educating everyone that cares to know what really happened, the real story about his last year. Topsy reports diagnosed Williams with diffuse Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia. To a form of dementia. He had what's known as Lewy body dementia. Which was discovered only after his death. When you don't have a diagnosis and you're, you're going down these trails of trying to find out what's going on, that is scary. The terror of where's this coming from? Robin asked, do I have dementia? Am I schizophrenic? Um, and OK, now, right? Is that clear or not? And this is what other families are going through, an example of what's going on in many lives. Having a diagnosis would have meant everything. Doing the press for that last movie was really, I mean, it was very complicated emotionally. And to be really blunt, I'm really proud of the fact that there were 200 people on that set every day, and not one of them spoke to anyone ever about the struggles we saw Robin enduring, but it no longer feels loyal to be silent about it, but maybe more loyal to share without shame, without secrecy, um, that yeah, this guy was hurting. He was going through something that he didn't have a name for yet. And it doesn't bring Robin back, but it does give clarity. Because a completely new variable was entered late into the equation of Robin Williams' life, which ended his life. Um, the Robin that we watched all those years, the, the man who put himself out there, um, the man who went overseas to entertain troops, the man who would entertain uh, the crews on the sets, 
um, the man who would hug and hold on to his friends, that was very real. After he left in his bedside table, there was a few items, just a few things. And every once in a while, uh, I would pull that drawer open um, when I missed him and just wanted him to tell me something. I opened up that book and I was like, wow. And I remember that when we were talking about what we wanted to, what we wanted to be able to leave is our legacy. And for Robin, it was that, that he wanted to help people be less afraid. When you get to know, you know, Robin, just as our friend and our neighbor, like all of us knew him, that's one thing. But when you actually, there's a realization about the impact that he had on a global basis. The last scene for the Night at the Museum franchise is Robin and Ben Stiller saying goodbye and knowing that they are probably not gonna see each other again. That was the scene. We didn't realize that that was real life. It's time for your next adventure. I have no idea what I'm gonna do tomorrow. How exciting. Bye, Teddy. Farewell, Lawrence. If you saw his movies, Robin's movies, you, you saw one side of Robin. But the biggest blessings is who he was as a human being. He was a loving soul, and that was who he was. But he's totally open, you know. And he understood the bigness of love. Oh man, this guy, I mean, I feel around him all the time. There'll be a moment when I just burst out laughing. I hear his voice in my ear. It's just, you know, one of the joys of my life, if not the, I mean, that was the best friend I ever had, you know I mean? Truly. It was just the time, it was the ride of a life, man. <sighs> I just love him so much. Yeah, there's a sadness, and then you have to go, then there's also, um, there's also hope. I mean, a sadness, it's always like, you know, you wish they hadn't happened, but they did. And the purpose is to make you different. It's what they call a Buddhist gift. It's that idea of you're back, and you realize the thing that matters are others, way beyond yourself. Self goes away. Ego, bye-bye. Realize there are a lot, a lot of amazing people out there to be grateful for and a loving God, and that, other than that, good luck. That's what life is about.